Welcome. I'm glad you're all here. It's a, a good crowd. The Hammond Railroad, while not necessarily local to the Greenfield area, is at least a Western Mass Railroad. It was built in 1911, 12, 13 ish from a point in Springfield to a point in Palmer. And I'll go through all of that within the slide, you know, where it went, why it was built, all that sort of thing. What I've got today is a little kind of abbreviated um, presentation than what I normally do. I normally present to rail fans, people who love railroads and work on them or, you know, study them, that sort of thing. A lot of technical details I, I pulled out because I didn't think that was uh, as interesting to the, the audience I expect to be here. You know, you're looking for local people, a story. Um, one of the things that really got me going on this railroad was uh, I was able to purchase 400 photographs of the construction of this railroad 108 years ago, which are absolutely awesome. And these are the original prints. The negatives are long since gone, but these are probably the only prints that exist for that, that railroad. And you'll see them sprinkled throughout the presentation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be facing the screen, but I'll use the mic over here so you should be able to hear me just fine. Okay? So uh, I'll get, just get started. Okay, one thing that got me started was, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of uh, business work in uh, Hamden County, you know, east of Springfield out towards Sturbridge area. And, uh, you know, I'd stop and have my lunch next to the railroad track somewhere. I'd take a little walk for a few minutes. And I found this bridge out in the woods and said, well, this is obviously a railroad bridge, but what did it go over? Why is it there? The only answer I could get is, oh, that's the Hamden Railroad. It never ran. What? More questions, right? And then a little more exploring. It's grown in a little bit, you see. But this granite marker here, it says B81 on it. And that means 81 miles to Boston from this point. Whoa, gee, more questions still. So, okay, and driving up and down around Palmer, I see all these big, strange cement works. What is this stuff? Well, that's actually the bridge abutment for a railroad bridge to go over this particular road. It's a mighty construction, it's probably 30 feet tall. Okay, and then I found out that uh, the town of Palmer, the little town of Palmer, had seven railroads in it. Boston and Albany became Penn Central, Conrail is now CSX. The Central Vermont that runs down through Irving and Miller's Falls is now the New England Central Railroad, the Ware River Branch, the Boston and Albany. Uh, that's still under a new name now. The Alco Branch is all gone. The Central Mass Branch went from Northampton to Boston, 105 miles, right through the center part of the state. The Hamden Railroad, huh, what's that? The Southern New England? That one was never completed. <clears throat> So let's, let's take a step back in time to 1913. The New England area was dominated by three main railroads, a bunch of small ones too. The New Haven had most of southern New England, like say everything south of like Springfield area, all of Rhode Island, Connecticut, that sort of thing. The Boston and Maine covered its namesake cities and did most of northern New England. The B&A, Boston and Albany, went east-west through Mass. Boston, Framingham, Worcester, Springfield, Pittsfield, Albany, uh, down through the southern tier, we'll call it. But we found that passengers still couldn't travel from the rich southwest, let's call it New York area, to the vacation areas in New Hampshire and Maine, going through Boston without changing stations. This, there was no direct rail link between south and north stations, and there still is not today. You know, if you came in by rail from New York, you'd have to get a taxi to take you to the other station. <clears throat> now, finding out that my, my thing is dying. Okay, this, this reddish part, all of this in the bottom, this is all New Haven Railroad. This line is the line for Greenfield right there, out of Boston, and, you know, spokes out there. This is the Connecticut River line that we have the Amtrak on today. And this yellow line you can barely see, that's, that's uh, central Vermont that runs down through Miller's Falls and through Palmer and down to New London. So how can I get around this whole bottleneck over here? You can see the slash right there. You can't get from here to there. You can't get there from here, they say in Maine. Uh, so they had a concept, let's build a little connector railroad over here so I can get you know, come up to Springfield, take a little line over here, and then I can go into Boston that way and go up to my vacation lands. That was part of the concept behind building Hammond. I like, 
I'm sorry for the, the poor graphic, but that's the best I can do. So, as I said, that was the concept for the Hamden Railroad, a connector for traffic to and from the southwest to northeast New England. The eastern connection at Bondsville was with the Central Mass Division, as I said, of Boston Main, take a right into North Station. The western connection was kind of up in the air, but near Springfield, we'll call it. <coughs> Designed and built for heavy traffic and high speeds. When I left this slide in, some of the, uh, some of the driving forces behind it. You're probably hearing of John Pierpont Morgan, J.C. Morgan, and his, his big New York banks. They've got all the money in the world. Charles Sanger Mellon was president of the New Haven Railroad and of Boston and Maine. So he chose this poor gentleman over here, Mr. Gillette, to build and operate this. Ralph Dickinson Gillette was president of the Warren Oak Construction Company out of Westfield. He was a railroad and trolley builder. He became president of both the Hamden Railroad and the Hamden Investment Company. I'm sure a lot of coaching from Mr. J.P. Morgan up here on how to how to play games with money. So, this, these are some of the, the black and white pictures are going to be some of those ones that I bought that, are, that just show the construction. In the early 1910s, this was nearly all hand work. As many as a thousand men worked on this 14 mile line at any one time. You can see they cleared the forest, some stumps are there, this sort of thing. They did a survey plan. This is through Ludlow. You can't even find any of this stuff now, and I'll, I'll tell you why later on. But you know, you can see that slash across horizontally. That's the Hamden Railroad. These are all filed with the county because they're land takings. Let's put some temporary tracking. Looks pretty sketchy, doesn't it? This kind of logs with some rail spike to it. Well, that's, that's all they needed to get the work done, get the equipment in there. I love this one, men at work. A lot of men working and one guy standing around, got to be supervisor, another supervisor. There, there's the poor guy working, and everybody else is watching him, just like state jobs today. <laughs> okay, um, one of the recent inventions probably came out of the Hoosick Tunnel was these steam power drills. They would make the holes to put the dynamite in to blow up the rocks so that you could pop, take the small pieces of rock away. So that, that was in pretty common use up there. And here we see a couple of them. They're, they're just blasting away at this rock to make a big cut, trying to get this whole area cleared out. And these are obviously temporary work tracks along the front there. Now, we did have steam shovels back then, these big 30-ton uh, bucket loaders, like uh, most of us remember Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel of Marianne, both that Captain Kangaroo used to read all the time. This is one on railroad tracks, and it would move in and out take the big pieces of rock and put them on a car and haul it away. And there we are, we're putting a, we're picking up all this junk, putting it on this little flat car and haul that away somewhere and get it out of the way. You can see he's working pretty deep in this Belcher Town cut. That's got to be 40 feet below the surface of the earth. And you're just digging down to make this cut so the rubber can go through. And I left this one, and this is one of those work trains, and I just love this guy right here. He looks like he's so proud, just standing there, big as life. But these little tiny engines did all, a lot of moving around of these cars and things. And you got to pay the guy, so everybody lines up to get their uh, dollar ten for the week. So one of the things they had to do was, in, in the low spot, you need to raise the track up so you don't have these big... Uh, um, inclines that the railroads can't handle. So we, uh, the railroad would build these temporary trestles, run all that garbage, rocks and dirt and out, and just dump it down to fill that in to raise the railroad up. You see the actual ground level is down here, but I need it to be up here. So we uh, just working on it, making that fill. Now there's, there's several big Big construction projects, and I'm going to go through some of those with so a few pictures here, kind of big. This is a Fuller Brook culvert in Chicopee. It's a 10 foot wide culvert, 200 feet long, and the fill on top of it, as we just saw, is going to be 75 feet tall. Next couple of slides are really great. There, we're filling it in, we're filling it in, a little more filling in. You can still see the little culvert over here down the lower left. Filling in, filling in. And that's what it looks like today. You've driven across the top of it and didn't even know it. That's on the mass pipe, just east of the old exit six. Mm -hmm. 
moved from Struinig and Drive. You can still see that culvert, same cement work. There's another culvert in, uh, on, over Broadbrook, which is west of South Street in Belchertown. Forms in place, they're going to pour, pour the cement in place and then pull the wooden forms out around it. Another one, 20 feet wide and 200 feet long, just these huge construction works. And uh, Page Boulevard in Springfield, the old uh, Route 20A, had the, the Hamden Railroad go across the top of it here. That is somebody's old car there. And if you're really sharp, you can see the trolley tracks down here, and there's the trolley wire, the trolley one out there, too. This is uh, similar to that uh, land-taking drawing that we saw. You know, here, here's yet one of those little small roads. There's the Hamden Railroad being constructed over the top of it. Then uh, where's Woods Pond? You know, it looks like we're going to cut right through it with the railroad. Now we're going to do a 700 foot long fill up to 40 feet deep just to fill in that pond so I can put a railroad across it. Back then you could do that sort of thing because there's no EPA filings, no wetlands protection. We just fill in the pond and put a railroad in. This is progress. Now, mass bike burns right over that same piece of thing. If you were near exit 7 in Ludlow, you might see a little puddle of water on the south side. That's all that's left of Woods Pond. You barely know it. I've, I've talked to people from Ludlow and they, they didn't realize it was all there before. Okay, and then uh, right near the junction, the Hamden went under the Boston and Maine Railroad. This is a pretty popular spot for photographs. You can see that uh, here's the construction train ball below. Here's a passenger train headed eastbound. Uh, here's a road they moved to go over the top of it. All these uh, telegraph wires. Looks like a busy place. And East Springfield, near where my wife grew up, uh, this is what it looked like. It's all industrialized now. You can't see hardly any of this stuff. The tall trees, there's the Hampton Road, straight as an arrow. It's the only thing there. Of course, you have to build railroad support structures. There were four stations along this 14-mile line. There's one water tank and the, and the spout, because you got to, the steam trains get pretty thirsty, and they need water all the time. Put in signal lines and telegraph wires. This is a picture of one of the stations. They were all pretty much the same basic design. Brick and stucco siding, tile roofs. East Springfield and Ludlow had separate freight and passenger stations. This one's a combination station. This is Three Rivers, and Thorndike was identical to it. And I love those little fisheye windows in the attic. Those, those are a nice architectural feature. And then uh, all the officials want to get in the business. They're, they're going to take this little hand car and take, take a tour. One of the big construction projects, you'll see a few pictures in a few minutes, was uh, this big trestle at Bertram Bank. You can see on the left-hand side there. It's an inspection train. Somehow, I don't think that uh, public safety and everything would let people ride in a car like that. Well, there's benches and this little sticks along the side of it so you don't fall off. But that, this was okay then. So, uh, as I said, uh, some of the accomplishments. The Birch and Bend trestles, 1,055 feet across, 82 feet tall, 300 foot clear span of the Chicopee River. There'll be pictures coming up in a minute. Also crossed Worcester Street and the trolley line. The Swift River Bridge over in Palmer was 800 feet across the valley, spanned the Swift River and the Central Vermont Railroad. We saw the, the steam shovel making some of these uh, deep cuts. They moved 1,600,000 cubic yards of material for fill. By Minnichog Mountain was 800,000. Palmer cut was 700,000. We saw him working in the Belcher Town cut was only 160,000 cubic yards. Okay, over in, uh, in Springfield, this line over here is that Boston and Albany main line, still very busy line today. You know what this building is over here. It says Henry Manufacturing Company, but if you go down Route 291 in Springfield, you see this big white building that says Tyflex on it. That's what this was. They used to make bicycles and motorcycles in there. But this shows the branching off. There's the Hamden Railroad. There's the Athol branch that ran all the way up to Athol from there. There's the sidings into the, into the manufacturing facility because everybody used coal for heat then. Okay, here's that uh, Connecticut River Valley at Birch and Bend. 
It, it's kind of hard to see, but we've got some of the clearing down here. The brush is cut down. There's a little bit over here. You can barely see it, but there's a, there's a house and a barn over here. <clears throat> so the railroad's got across the Chicopee River, a trolley line, and a road. And the trolley line and the road are right down there. There we've got some of the construction done. We've got some big cement works here. We've got a walkway across the river so we can start working on both sides. There's more steel work done. We're working on it. Then there's this, you know, they put these big anchors in for this big clear span across the bridge. They're, they're working on the steel over the river. They put in this wooden work, wooden stuff at the, at the bottom here. It's called false work. That's just to hold up the steel until it's all put together. There's a view of the River Valley under construction, possibly, you know, just before that previous slide. There's a clear span of the river. I colorized this one myself. It was fun. So there, there's this big, long clear span. No, no pier in the middle of the river, just the one on each side. And as I said, that's, that's just over 1,000 feet across the valley. Over in Palmer, we did a similar construction, the Swift River and the CD Railroad. There's the first bridge. That looks pretty shaky to me. <laughs> but then we put up all this steel work. Those monuments are still there. We're going to hang it, put these big pieces of steel up on top of those concrete monuments. Back then, they used this steam-powered uh, crane to pick up the steel. Incredible. You can tell he's really working hard. A lot of black smoke. And there's a big piece of steel going to go right up there. There's a picture of the finished one again across the valley. The river is over here. The, this is the Central Vermont Railroad. NECR is still active now. And there, there's this 800-foot bridge across the valley. And I've been right up to all of these spots. It's really fun to see what used to be there. Okay, so let's say we've got it all built. Well, what's, what happens next? Well, we're going to put ads in the newspaper, all this sort of thing. And this is the only one I've seen of the actual finished railroad. I got this from a, a, somebody out in Ohio who was in his collection from Ludlow. You see this woman here and this guy here. We're speculating. She's taking a picture with a box camera of this gentleman here because she's holding her hands just so. But this is the Ludlow Station, the Ludlow Freight Station. There's the Hamden. There's something on the tracks down there on that passing side. And of course, we'll never know what it was. OK, as everything happens, the end of the line, what happens? Didn't open, um, various reasons for that. But the assets of this railroad was sold at a public auction in 1929. The high bidder was a scrap deal. He just wanted the steel. $30,000 on this $4.5 million construction project. What a bargain. Much of the land was almost immediately sold to the newly formed Western Mass Electric Company for rights of way. In the early 50s, five miles of the railroad right away were taken by the Turnpike Construct Commission for the new road. Everything east of exit six in Chicopee, where 291 ties in, if you had eastbound, you've got a five mile section that's straight and flat. And that's the old Hamden Railroad. Uh, this is Athol Junction. You can't see it, but this is the old Westinghouse plant right in there. There's the thing. The signal is set for a stop. The bar is set horizontal for a stop. All, all of these pictures show up, you know, like <clears throat> over time, but there's the Hamden Railroad. Straight as an arrow, right over to that big bridge is still in place. And there's the curve that it made and headed over towards Bondsville. This is before 1936. This road down here, this is uh, Page Boulevard in East Springfield, the old Route 20A. All highly industrialized now. And during World War I, which is shortly after the railroad did not open, World War I broke out and they started picking up all the scrap steel for all wartime projects. So this mile-long siding, they ripped up the siding, they left the main line, but they spared, took away the spare track for, uh, for the war efforts. 1938, uh, this is the East Springfield Station. You can see that nature and vandals have kind of taken their toll. The tile roofs are falling off, the windows are all busted out, stolen or whatever. Platforms here, there's no track here, they've taken it up already. 
Again, Ludlow, similar station, looks just the same, you know. Same condition, 1938, pretty sad. So I love some of these here and now comparisons. In 1913, this is the Birch and Bend Trestle. There's that White House I pointed out before. There it is again in 2007. It's still there today. But this is the abutment right below the photographer standing in the left-hand picture. Again, uh, then and now, there's that bridge construction one we saw a few minutes ago. There's that pier today. Three River Station, that nice one where the guys were on the hand car right here. There's that water tank. There's the station looking brand new and pristine. That's what it looks like today. It's probably a little more grown up today, but that's when I took the picture. All these little concrete constructions for all these little streams and things. There's 1913-ish, and there's today. There's my favorite bridge. You know, this guy here that I opened the presentation with. There it is in 1913 with that passenger train on it. There it is in 1940. This one just surfaced after I published the first book. That's that same bridge. The photographer's car is way over here, but that, that road is still there. That's been closed since. I have a friend of mine that lives, lives east of there. We explored that one day. And that uh, mile marker number 81 is down in the lower right corner. You just can't see it here, but over here there's a little white post. That's the mile marker on the Boston and Maine Central Mass. So I did a good thing. I, I made a little sign, this is HJ, and went out with a friend and we, uh, we put a stick in the ground and said this is where the junction was a hundred years ago. Well, it's 108 now. And I, I marked the longitude and latitude, so if you felt like trespassing, you could go find it. Technically, it's still railroad property. Uh, the uh, Palmer Historic Commission and the Mass Electric Company put in this, this monument near one of those tall uh, uh, cement constructions in, uh, in Palmer that uh, just gave, gave it its name, the Hamlet Row of 1910 to 1918. I don't agree with the dates, but that's all right. The railroad that never was. So thank you to a couple of people who got me started. Bob Buck got me started. Friends kept encouraging me and poking me and my lovely wife in the back there. Esther, most of you know her. She's been very patient with me while I wrote the first book. It took almost 30 years. The second book only took a few years. So there's my two books. They're both in the back of the room. I'll take any questions. I'll stand up in a moment and uh, you can See me for a copy of the books in the back. I have no pressure. If you don't want them, that's just fine. You probably find some of them at the libraries. Uh, I'm always looking for artifacts, new information, map photos. We can we can do family, we can do Hampton Road book three. I don't care. Uh, I can do a, a similar or a longer presentation for uh, libraries, historical societies. Just contact me at hamptonphil at gmail.com. And thank you again for your attention. Questions. You didn't answer the real question. Why didn't it open? Well, if you tell the State Railroad Commission that you're going to spend two million dollars on a project and you spend four and a half, what happens? They don't like that. Overruns happen all the time. Yeah, but not back then. It, it was unexpected back then. Now we expect it in all cons mass construction so projects. So they took all that sunk funds and just so abandoned the thing? They, they, they couldn't come up with the money. They couldn't account for the money. So they never were given the permission to operate by the Railroad Commission because the money was wrong. And it's just so sad to me which is why I had to complete the project and go through all the detail. Really, it's more detailed in the books, but it, that's basically it, is they overspent. They couldn't come up with the money. Uh, J.P. Morgan had died just before that, so he couldn't just cut him a check for the balance. Uh, just during the hearings with the Interstate Commerce Commission in Boston, Mr. Gillette, the actual construction guy, he got home to his home in Westfield, had a heart attack and died just like that. So there we are, we've got a railroad, cost too much to build, can't pay the bills, nobody to run it, nobody to kick in the money, and it's set, and set, and set. I like to use the term orphan railroad, but that's really some other project. You know, it, it's not really an orphan, it's almost stillborn if you'll accept that, that term. You know, that 
It's completed, it's ready to go, but no, no permission to operate. It's like when you build a house, you get a certificate of occupancy that says you can live in this house. The railroad needs a permit to operate, for lack of a better term, and they did not get that. Also in that 1913 time frame, we went from the Mass Railroad Commission, it's turned, it morphed into the Public Utilities Commission. So different people said, no, 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 you can't do that. So a number of different things all happened at the same time, and it just wasn't allowed to operate. They all, uh, those of us in the railroad community, you'll see on the map in the back, there's a lot of parallel lines in that area, and they said, well, why didn't you just use this other one? It went almost the same place. Instead of building this whole big thing, you could have used some of that and some of that and just built a short little stretch in here. Well, you know, that wasn't the concept they, they wanted. So, overly answers your question, but did that... No, it's, you're not even close, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> big smile under here. I am smiling, yeah. So, I mean, maybe you mentioned it, um, yeah. but who owns that land? Is it North... Is it, uh, was it Mass Electric, or...? It, it, because it was a Hamden Railroad, that must have been like an LLP or a corporation. It, it, was, an, it was incorporated, yes. Right, so... Um, it, so, you, so, so, so think long. about it, you have 200 feet wide, 14 miles long. Kind of hard to use it for much other than a railroad or a highway. Um, some of it was sold as rights of way to the electric company. You'll see some of their high voltage lines on some of that line. And back in the what, about 52, 53 time frame, the Mass, Railroad, Mass Highway Commission, the Turnpike Commission, took part of it for the, for the Mass Turnpike. And everything else is just kind of not owned, basically kind of reverts back to the abutters. You know, if, if your farm was bisected by this, you know, after a period of time, you might as well just farm it you know, continue farming it if it's available to you. You know, there's many places in Palmer where they've scooped out all the earth so they can pass their farm equipment through there again instead of going around. So technically nobody owns it right now. You know, Mr. Mark's Angel bought it in 1929, so he owned it then. I haven't done all of the stuff to, to chase down the land ownership. There's just too many tiny little parcels to chase down. But basically it goes back to the abutters. Well, some of the, some yeah. of the pictures that you show uh, of the big, big tall cement abutters, yeah. um, and, and uh, some of the other ones look like there's a lot of, it looks like it's in the woods almost, like it's not even yeah. vi uh, visible from the road. Um, so I, I kind of wonder if it was, it, it looks like it's more hidden than it is uh, visible. Yes, that, that is true. You have to know where to go look. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you do have to know, you have to seek it out to find it. So it's, some of it is through the woods. Yes, you're right. Um, the, those tall abutments and monuments and things, those are by the rivers. So they're a little more open. You could find those a little easier. There's usually a road nearby. Um, well, yeah, they're, they're not really out in the public except those tall abutments where you've got a road going through, you know, those are still active. Some of the smaller side streets, we'll call them, in Ludlow and Springfield area where they, they raised the railroad up so they didn't have a grade crossing, those were knocked down because they made them as narrow as possible. Usually one cart, you know, one, one automobile wide, let's say 10 feet, that's really not wide enough. The towns did all these uh, permits for public safety and things and knocked them down so they could put a two-lane road through there. That, that happened a lot in the 30s and the 40s when cars were becoming more plentiful. So I have a little follow-up question because yeah. I'm, I'm originally from Palmer ah. and um, I went for a walk with my sisters yep. um, last year and yep. we went on this big white path that looks like it could have been a railroad path yep. on the I don't know, on the side of the river that goes to Ludlow from Three Rivers. Is that, was that, was that where the railroad was? Probably was. I, I, I can't picture exactly where you're trying to describe to me, but there were a number of railroads through there. <clears throat> so the, you know where 
the, the three rivers come together. So if you're coming down from Belgium, oh, yeah, yeah. Down, yep. across the river. Yep. Okay, so you know where the old Lissus Cafe was? No. On the right at Pinocchio's coming down through from Belchertown? Yep. Okay, on the right hand side, right after Pulaski Park. Okay. All right, you know where that is? Yeah, so pretty much. Okay. So right to the right of that, where that old Lissus Cafe is, there's this, this big long walk that we walked all the way that, to That was the Apple Branch. Oh, it was. That was the Apple Branch. That ran on the north side of the Chicopee River there. Yep. Ran east-west, we'll call it, for lack of a better direction. And then turned a little north. If you went, if you were going north on that same road, and you take that right turn on Railroad Street, you go up and you'll find one of those station locations, the one where it's just the footing now. That's up that road about a mile and a quarter on the right, just before the Swift River bridge crossing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. More questions? This is a real basic question. I'm really new to this uh, no, that's cool. study, so. Quite all right. If the uh, tracks, you know, the tracks are all laid out and so forth, yep. which trains are allowed to go on that track if the, they were all approved? Is it a separate entity, or was that part of their plan? Uh, well, it, um, it was basically a bridge road between two other roads. Yeah. As I said, the, the, the plan was to try to route passenger traffic up through there to get up to Maine, sure. we'll say. So that <clears throat> I found a newspaper article that I, and one, time, one railroad timetable that showed six trains each way each day, passenger trains, to move people from southern Connecticut, New York area-ish, up through Springfield, up onto the Hampton and over to, to Bondsville to get into New York, to Boston. So there was going to, there was expected to be a lot of traffic. Okay. So is it like an airport, you know, when a plane lands and pays a fee to the airport, is it the same with trains using tracks? Uh, yeah, there'd, there'd be some monetary arrangement, yeah. Um, in, in some of the, the articles and uh, other papers that I've found, the Boston and Maine that we know from up here was going to lease that from the rail, from the Hamden Railroad Corporation for 5% of the cost every year for 20 years. So in 20 years they would pay themselves sure. back. But that, that was under a lease arrangement. That's so they could operate the trains over it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, good. Anyone else? Anything? Rocky again. <laughs> <laughs> you showed a picture of one of the stations with people waiting. Yes. And you said, you know, waiting for a train that never came. Right. Now, if no trains ever ran. Why were they at that station? Because it was in the newspaper. Trains are going to start running tomorrow. Are you kidding? They just showed up hoping a train would come? Of course. <laughs> well, in 1913, what else is there to do? <laughs> I don't recall what day of the week it was, but, you know. Let's assume these people had nothing to do. It was after church on Sunday. Let's go hang out. <laughs> Wait for the train. It might come. Great. Okay. <laughs> Again, thank you all for coming. I hope I enlightened you a little bit, at least told you a good story. Thanks for coming. Thank you.